Hi, this is Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis. Normally for these kinds of videos, I like to have my face up so that you can see it. Um, but this video, there's going to be a lot of math and I want to make sure that we've got plenty of room to write. So this one, we're going to be just uh, with the screen behind us here, or that's the only thing we're going to see. Okay, so this is a combustion problem that specifically comes from the OpenStax book. Uh, that we're using. This is a link to where that problem came from. Um, and so we're going to walk through some of the key components here. So like I said, this is a combustion problem. Um, a key way that you can tell that this is a combustion problem is that it says that something gets burned. And in this problem, it's going to be naphthalene here. The problem doesn't really give you a lot of information about naphthalene. It gives you a, a molecular mass and it says it's about 130 AMU atomic mass units, um, but it doesn't give you a specific one. That's going to be asking us for our empirical formula and our molecular formulas. The beginning of this problem is going to be where stoichiometry comes into play. Um, and the end of this problem is going to be very much like the empirical and molecular formula problems that we've already done. One of the things that I would suggest that uh, when you start doing one of these problems is for you to write out some kind of a chemical equation to let you know or help orient yourselves um, what's happening. So in this case, we have naphthalene and it's burning with oxygen because that's how combustion reactions are going to go. We're going to have to have some kind of fuel source, in this case, naphthalene. We're going to have oxygen here, and what we're going to produce is CO2 and water. The CO2 and water will always be our products as long as we are doing a complete combustion. Um, we can have more stuff out here. Like if we have incomplete combustion, you could maybe have in carbon monoxide, some other things. This problem though, we're gonna, in most problems in this class, we're gonna assume that we are dealing with complete combustion. Now the problem lets us know that we've got a three milligram sample of our naphthalene here. And when it burns, it produces 10.3 milligrams of carbon dioxide. So if we go over here to our carbon dioxide, we know that 10.3 milligrams of this stuff has been produced. So a thing that I would want to point out to you at this point is more points. The thing that I would want you to recognize is all of the carbon here from the CO2 had to have come from the naphthalene. The oxygen doesn't have any carbon in it. Um, but the naphthalene does. And then the problem gives us up here saying that naphthalene has only carbon and hydrogen in it. So this 10.3 milligrams of carbon dioxide, the carbon portion of that carbon dioxide came from the naphthalene. Likewise, the naphthalene is our only source of hydrogen for the water. Our source for our oxygen is going to be our oxygen. So the CO2 and the water, their oxygens, are going to come from the oxygen. And typically in these kinds of combustion processes, um, you're going to find that the thing that burns is going to be your limiting reactant, and the oxygen is going to be an excess reagent reason that that limiting reactant and that excess reagent part is important is because you're always going to be you're always going to want to be hesitant about ever using oxygen here as a way to determine how much oxygen got actually generated or was actually used um, in the production of these products so even if the naphthalene did have oxygen in it it doesn't but if it did, it could be producing oxygen here. It could be, or it could be used for the, the oxygen here in the CO2. It could be used for the oxygen in the water, but so could our excess. Um, and because there is potentially more than one source of the oxygen, we want to make sure that we are not going to 
<laughs> really not going to solve for oxygen. Um, and that'll make a little bit more sense here in a minute. So let's go ahead and let's get that pin color back to a red. Actually, let's do something fun. Let's do maybe a light blue. There we go. Fantastic. Now it's time to figure out how much of this 10.3 milligrams is actually carbon. So to do that, we're going to use some dimensional analysis. And so the 10.3 milligrams of our CO2 and in order to figure out a relationship of of carbon dioxide to carbon, specifically all the carbon that was available in our naphthalene, we can't do a grams to grams relationship. We can only do moles to moles. So we need to go ahead and get this 10.3 milligrams into grams and then into moles. We could do millimoles and we could do milligrams, but we're not gonna because we're not. Oops, it's not a thousand. It would be a thing if the pin would work. And hi pin, I'm gonna need you to work now. Well, apparently it's decided that it wants a totally different color. Fine, that's not the color. Green it is. That's not the color neither. I tell you, here, we'll go bigger. There we go. Milligrams cancel one gram up here in the top. And so now we're going to have grams of our CO2. We use our molar mass of our CO2, 44 grams of our CO2 for every one mole of our CO2. Okay, then time to ask ourselves for every one mole of CO2, how many moles of carbon are there? Based on the chemical formula, it's going to be one mole of carbon. And specifically, this is the carbon that was in the CO2, but that carbon is the carbon that came from the naphthalene. So... If we now say we've got 12 grams of carbon for every one mole of carbon, so multiplying by the molar mass of our carbon, the mass of carbon that would be produced here is now going to be equal to the amount of our carbon that was originally in the naphthalene sample. But for a reason that's going to make a little bit more sense here in a second, I want to go ahead and convert this into milligrams. So one gram, thousand milligrams, and we're then going to be equal to uh, a nice little 2.809 milligrams. Specifically, this is 2.8 zero nine milligrams of carbon that was in our original naphthalene sample. So this we're using our stoichiometry um, that we've talked about in class up to this point um, to figure this out. So we're starting instead of with the uh, reactant, we're starting with the product. And instead of figuring out, oh, how much naphthalene directly, we are saying, well, how much carbon from the naphthalene was there? Now, the naphthalene sample was 3.000 milligrams, and we just said, based off of our math, the 2.809 milligrams of that was carbon. That's a 9 there. So, a little bit of math, and that gives us a remainder of 0 0.191 milligrams. The only thing that was left in our sample besides the carbon was the hydrogen. So now we have our mass of our carbon and our hydrogens. At this point in time, we have now set this up for an elemental analysis uh, empirical formula problem. So empirical formula problem.
those empirical formula problems, just to remind you, start out a little something like this. So we've got our 2.8, and that's a 2, 2.80 milligrams of our carbon. We don't really like working with milligrams, so let's go ahead and convert that over to grams real quick. So we use our conversion factor, and now we're in grams of carbon. Now we need to ask ourselves, all right, how many moles of carbon is this? And using our periodic table and our atomic mass, we now can calculate our moles of carbon. So if we hit enter at this point in time, we end up with 2.341 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of carbon. We need to come over and we need to do the same kind of treatment to our hydrogen now. So let's take the mass of our hydrogen. It's molar, or I'm sorry, it's atomic mass. So one gram of hydrogen for every, or oops, not one gram. We're not doing the atomic mass yet. We need to get out milligrams. So let's get it out of milligrams here. And then we can say our one gram of hydrogen has an atomic mass of, um, oh, yeah, has a, it's not one gram of hydrogen. Why don't you guys stop me? I tell you, it's like this thing on YouTube. It's like you don't have the exact same experience. 1.0079 grams of hydrogen because that would be our atomic mass for every one mole of hydrogen. And so then we end up with a number that looks something like 1.895 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of hydrogen. And if you're now saying, yeah, we need to divide by the species that has the least number of moles, you're right. So we divide both of these by the 1.895 times 10 to the negative fourth, the 1.895 times 10 to the negative fourth. Um, and this is really moles of hydrogen. And this would be moles of hydrogen. And we're gonna end up with a number that for our carbon is something like 1.24 moles of carbon for every one mole of hydrogen and the hydrogen's one to one. So with these numbers that we just wrote out, we can write out our fancy dancy little chemical empirical formula of 1.24 H1. And alarm bell should be going off in your head saying, um, we can't have a fraction or a decimal as part of our chemical formulas and you're right. The only way to get rid of that is to multiply everything here in the bottom by four. So then we end up with our lowest common denominator whole numbers, which would be uh, C5H4. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is your empirical formula. At this point in time, it's we've solved the first part of this question. And as a nice little review for you, I'm going to refer you to your notes and previous materials regarding the molecular formula. So down here at the bottom, all of this stuff that's on the screen is kind of a review from things that we've already done. But this stuff up here at the, on the screen now um, this is where we're combining the material that we've just learned, specifically our stoichiometry and um, conversion of one thing to the other thing. So this is our video on how to do combustion analysis problems, and I hope it has been helpful. The principles for almost every single one of these questions are going to be the exact same. Um, so, yep. Please let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching. See you next time.